Bismillahi Rahmani Rahim. Vice President Farhad Mawani, Your Excellencies, my Lords, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Akbar Dalla, and as your MC, I am delighted to welcome you to the Ismaili Center for the third of our Diamond Jubilee Lecture Series commemorating 60 years of the Imamat of His Highness the Aga Khan. One of the goals of the Diamond Jubilee is to engender a more balanced perspective about the Muslim world's civilizations, cultures, and interpretations. One way to do this is to seek inspiration from the Prophet's life, peace be upon him and his progeny, by reflecting upon his deep commitment to building communities with universal values, which embraced and respected the diversities of all people. It is apposite, therefore, that we celebrate the annual Milad lecture tonight, entitled The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, a model for our time, and hear how the Prophet's approach to societal issues could show a pathway to greater human understanding in today's world order. It is a wonderful opportunity to bring together members of the Ummah and those among whom we live during this Diamond Jubilee year to the Ismaili Center, one of six such buildings around the world that through their design and functions reflect a mood of dialogue, contemplation, humility, and friendship, providing spaces for greater intellectual reflection and fostering an appreciation for human understanding. Our keynote speaker tonight is Mr. Rafiq Abdullah, a lawyer, poet, and author. In 2016, he wrote a book entitled Reflecting Mercury, Dreaming Shakespeare's Sonnets, which are his ruminations on the sonnets. It was in this very hall that the book was launched by the former Minister of Culture, Lord Gowrie, himself a poet, when the Ismaili community celebrated the 300th anniversary of the Bard. Rafiq Abdullah is also an exponent on the poetry of the Muslim mystics Rumi and Attar, and has written books on both. He sits on the board of a committee of the English pen that deals with translations, a field which is close to his heart. He has spent many years contributing to a meaningful dialogue on interfaith relations, for which he was awarded an MBE in 1999. For many years, Rafiq was a commentator for the BBC World Service on Islamic issues. While he has interacted with people at many levels of society, it is at the level of the most marginalized that he has found the greatest joy in his work. This year, he was awarded the highest honor as a non-executive director of the Southwest London and St. George's Mental Health Trust for his contribution to integrating the arts with mental health and laying the foundation for continued innovation to address inequalities among minorities and ethnic groups. The foundation he has laid over the decade has established an important pathway to giving voice to the voiceless from this important segment of society. Rafiq, thank you so much for being with us here today. We are so honored. Following on from Rafiq's lecture, we will have a discussion and a question and answer session, which will be moderated by Dr. Nadia Ibu Jamal, who I will introduce a little later in the program. But first, to begin our evening, I am pleased to invite the Vice President of the Ismaili National Council for the UK, Dr. Farhad Mawani, to make some opening remarks. Vice President Farhad. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, my Lord, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu Alaikum and Ya Ali Madad. On behalf of the President and members of the Ismaili Council for the United Kingdom, it gives me distinct pleasure to welcome you all to the Ismaili Center this evening. The occasion of Milad 
which marks the birthday of Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him and his family, is an event of great significance for Muslims and on behalf of the Ismaili community, I thank you all for being with us this evening, including those watching via webcast for the 2017 Milad and Nabi lecture. Birthdays of extraordinary figures can be celebrated in many ways. Most, for Muslims, this is another opportunity to engage with the intellectual traditions and cultural expressions in Islam. We are not alone in celebrating this way. Indeed, there are many sister Muslim communities celebrating Milad through lectures, devotional songs, poetry, and storytelling. To that end, this building regularly hosts such programs that brings peoples of all communities together so that we may know each other better. As Akbar mentioned, we are celebrating the Diamond Jubilee of His Highness the Aga Khan. It is a time to inspire us all, and particularly our youth, to do more to champion and act upon core values and principles, such as promoting pluralism, caring for the environment, standing up for inequality in our society, and helping improve the quality of life of the underprivileged. Partly as a consequence of the search for answers to the challenges of modern life, and partly as a consequence of socioeconomic, political, and other factors, the Muslim world is in turmoil today. Sensationalism-hungry journalists and even some scholars say that it is a struggle for the soul of Islam. Others believe that Islam needs its own reformation, similar to the history in Christian Europe, as if it was a single trajectory that all communities must follow, irrespective of the historical context. Some go much further and declare that Islam is incompatible with the values of the modern world. Although not all, but some of these attitudes may be broadly classified as Islamophobic, and they risk becoming self-fulfilling prophecies. This is because one of the responses to Islamophobia is to accept Islam's incompatibility with Western civilization and, bank and brand the latter as materialistic and culturally bankrupt. Here, we need to find an enlightened response to these challenges. In this context, I am reminded of a quote from His Highness the Aga Khan. In his presidential address at the International Sirat Conference held in Karachi, Pakistan, in March 1976, he said, and I quote, the Holy Prophet's life gives us every fundamental guideline that we require to resolve the problem as successfully as our human minds and intellects can visualize. His example of integrity, loyalty, honesty, generosity both of means and time, his solicitude for the poor, the weak and the sick, his steadfastness in friendship, his humility in success, his magnanimity in victory, his simplicity, his wisdom in conceiving new solutions for problems which could not be solved by traditional methods without affecting the fundamental concept of Islam, surely, all these are foundations which, correctly understood and sincerely interpreted, must enable us to conceive what should be a truly modern and dynamic Islamic society in the years ahead." End of quote. I note how His Highness reminds us that the Prophet's example needs to be correctly understood and sincerely interpreted. All of us are familiar with case studies of how the Prophet's example has been used to justify some of the most despicable acts. That is why it is important to devote time, particularly on occasions such as Milad and Nabi, to carefully reflect on the Prophet's model and draw out principles that may be applicable in contemporary times. Thus, I am eager to hear our guest speaker, Rafiq Abdullah. Akbar has kindly already introduced Rafiq Abdullah and, our, and Nadia earlier on this evening. But if I may add, Rafiq is what I would refer to as a closet Muslim. 
He does not go around brandishing his credentials. Rather, he lets his work and his actions speak for themselves. That is clearly something we have in common as a community, but clearly I would say that standing here today. Ruffig is also a friend, and I would recommend that you find a copy of his adaptive works on Athar, Rumi, and Shakespeare, as mentioned earlier this evening. Rafik, thank you for being here this evening and for all you have done over the years to bridge society by, by using, amongst other mediums, arts as a conduit to bring us together. Nadia, thank you also very much for helping moderate us this evening, which I think it will be in great need of. Finally, may I take the opportunity on behalf of all present to extend our collective gratitude to all the volunteers, too many to mention individually, for supporting this evening's lecture. Thank you very much, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce the report. I have to tell you that the Vice President is my PR agent, so thank you very much. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. Good evening, members of the external Relations, Your Excellencies, leaders of different faith communities, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored to be here tonight to speak at this important event in this magnificent center, and I think we may even have the opportunity of having a look later on at the various parts of this building. It's an, it's a, it's an example of the portfolio of marvelous buildings that the Ismaili community has created worldwide. And I'm grateful to the council for inviting me to speak here this evening. You know, we're living in challenging times when nothing is certain. Perhaps this was always the case, but one feels it more keenly today. It seems to me that there are three major drivers of change. There are probably more, but the one I want to pick on three today. Namely, rapid, if apparently faltering, globalization, exponential techn technological growth, and drastic climate change over which we appear to have no control. Structures, political, economic, social, and religious appear to be under stress. The environment is threatened by natural events like hurricanes, famines, floods, tsunamis, tsunamis, but also by our own driving need to commodify everything for profit and power. Added to this dreaded specter of nuclear war, which has now become an urgent again, with various states vying with each other for power and influence, even the expense of destroying us all. Humanity is also in danger of being overwhelmed by the influence of artificial intelligence as robots threaten to take us over. This is a nightmare of Frankensteinian proportions. And it's against this background that I would like to present my lecture tonight entitled Muhammad, peace be upon him, a model for our time, the man and the ideal. I shall argue this reflects universal values as parts of the Abrahamic family of faiths, which developed over the past few millennia. For each of these faiths, as well as other major traditions, or like Hinduism and Buddhism, for example, address the larger existential issues that beset all of us, whereby we strive to make meaning of our lives and find a purpose. Islam is the youngest of the Abrahamic faith traditions, and Muhammad is the only prophet who was born in the full glare of history. His life and traditions constitute an example for some 1.6 billion and growing people today across the world, covering many time zones, cultures, languages, and traditions. When we examine his life anew, we may find, if not solutions, then pointers for a new way of dealing with our present world. Therefore, I want to touch on Muhammad the man, born in Mecca around 570 CE, and who lived in the Arabia of that time, which is made up of a group of tribes and clans with their own rules of propriety and social ordering. I will also speak on Muhammad the ideal, whose example and teachings continue to influence the lives of Muslims today. We should remember that when Muhammad was born, Mecca and Medina were thriving trading centers 
which had connections with the surrounding Persian and Byzantine empires. We should also remember that like all of us, he was born and existed in a physical and historical context where a multitude of issues were extant and with which the new faith was revealed through him, it had, which the new faith had to grapple with. Responses to these challenges were not automatic and had to be negotiated carefully, taking into consideration the transitional nature of society at that time and the new way of the world that was being created by the revelation. The Quran, which embodies the revelation, refers to the state of affairs largely by way of reminder by exhorting the faithful to build on the principles laid down by earlier prophets, which Islam respects and pays tribute to. What I want to do this evening is not to give you a history of pre-Islamic Arabia, but to share with you some critical issues that Muhammad had to deal with as man and as a prophet. I want to explore through his life and revelation, what I call the man and the ideal, the notions of inclusivity, or what we call today pluralism, conflict resolution, social justice, care and compassion, including that of the environment, search for knowledge and accountability, both personal and in the field of social governance. You will notice that these are political values in the wider sense. There are other profound principles, such as the life of the spirit, the inner vision, that enriches and enlivens all faiths and grounds us paradoxically in the possibility of glimpsing the transcendental in our lives. This sacred process gives us a deeper sense of meaning and purpose if we pursue what Islam calls the straight path, which does not simply consist of rules and ritual conformity, but is made up of the search of the soul for something beyond our daily concerns. This is commonly known as Sufism, the heart of prayer and faith. I will touch on all these issues. However, I want to add at the outset, this is important, that what I have to say is gleaned from my own readings and to interpretation of various texts. Texts are tricky. They are there to be read and interpreted. And inevitably, inevitably, they are read through each person's own perspective. Clearly, the perspective I will share with you this evening is one of a number, and there are many different ways in which the life and symbolic value of the prophet may be understood and expressed. We are also confronted by what appears to be a sea change in how we understand and manage to discover truth in today's media-obsessed, social-networked world in which delirious and narcissistic, narcissistic storytelling prevails. In fact, Truth, which implies a degree of necessary privacy and struggle, a dimension of private regard we all need in order to maintain some proper sense of identity, truth appears to have disappeared into the fretwork of lies and opinions that fill the ether. I think it is Mark Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg uh, Facebook, I, I, yeah, or whatever. Uh, <laughs> anyway the egregious Mark Zuckerberg, who declared that privacy, privacy, is no longer a viable state of being. It is no longer a norm. My God, a recipe, I believe, for insanity, both individual and social. We are still driven to make sense of our lives and the world we live in. And this evening, I'm going to have a stab at this by sharing with you my reading of the life and significance of the Prophet of Muhammad. Let me start with Muhammad the man. He was a merchant, born into the clan of the Quraysh in, the, in Mecca in the 6th century. His ancestors are said to be related to Abraham and were respectable members of the Meccan society of the time. He was married to Khatija, a woman of standing and wealth in her own right. And indeed, Muhammad worked for her as a trader which took him to various parts of the region, which enabled him to become aware of different cultures and traditions. As he grew older, material success was not enough. 
he became conscious of the depletion of ethical values which underpin a just society in the marketplace of Meccan tribal culture. One wonders how much it's changed. There were some tribal practices which Muhammad felt did not make for a just society, like the general status of women, the practice of female infanticide, the disproportionate retaliation which failed even to take regard of the albeit cruel principle of Talion. There were other injustices <clears throat> and imbalances too, but I won't go into it now because we haven't got the time. In spite of his relative success in his private and public life, Muhammad was troubled and he began the practice of retreating into a private space where he could meditate and reflect. For this practice he used to retreat, he used to retreat to the cave of Mount Hira outside Mecca. It was, one of, it was on one of these occasions, whilst he was meditating, that he was confronted and challenged by a presence which he later recognized came from God in the aspect of the angel Gabriel, who asked, indeed commanded Muhammad to read Ikra. Read in the name of your Lord who created you from a clot and taught you to read, to read that which you do not know. I've only um, uh, given you an outline of the words. Muhammad was overwhelmed. He was terrified. He rushed out of the cave in a state of great distress. He returned to his home, to his wife Khatija, shaking and sweating. She reassured him and covered him with a blanket to give him comfort. He told her what had happened and was terrified that he'd been possessed by demonic forces. Khatija was sure that this was not possession as such, but showed the lineaments of a revelation. <clears throat> Even though he had experienced this terrifying supernatural event, Muhammad's need to continue his inner search was paramount, and he returned to the cave to continue meditating. I think this showed immense courage and persistence on his part, because he was assailed again by this awesome presence. As time passed, he became absorbed by the exhortations of Angel Gabriel, who impressed upon him the first words of the Revelation, which later was to be collected into a book we now call the Quran. As a consequence of these early encounters with the Angel Gabriel, he was slowly drawn, after his initial doubts and fears that he was being possessed by a jinn, or demonic presence, into preaching the message he was receiving, which consisted of worshipping the one God and none other, since there were no other deities. This stance on the part of Muhammad was regarded by the Meccans as being treasonable and unnatural, since he was contradicting long-standing tribal mores and values. And this new revelation of the one God, namely Allah, also put into jeopardy the trading relationships of the Meccans with others who visited the city and the sanctuary called the Kaaba, which housed a pantheon of deities whom they worship. Thus, business was endangered by his subversive teachings. However, Muhammad was not daunted and continued to preach the message of the one God. His disciples were his wife, Khatija, his, son -in his cousin and later son-in-law, Ali, and they were joined later in due course in the first three years by a small group of new converts. And their security became endangered over time, so that the small group had to flee to Mecca for their, flee from Mecca um, for their lives. And they found refuge in Abyssinia, where the Christian leader called the Nagus gave them protection. The Nagus saw at once the similarity in belief between his faith and that of the new Muslims. They believed in the one God that's propounded in the earlier scriptures, which were followed by Jews and Christians. As we see, the beginnings of Islam were stormy and presented major challenges both to the exponents and to the recipients. Soon, Muhammad's own life was endangered and his family suffered consequently. consequently. He had to tread very carefully whilst he lived in Mecca. But finally his existence in that city became impossible and he departed from Mecca to Medina. And this flight of the Prophet to Medina, which is called the Hijra, marks the beginning of the Islamic era and Muhammad's status as the head of the first 
Muslim polity, where the Compact of Medina, a charter which was based on the principle of working together with other faiths and traditions towards a shared vision of justice, was established. Now, this, this novel agreement enabled various faith communities to live together in the city. One could regard this charter as a prototype of what today we call a pluralistic ethos, taking into account the context of the time and its creation. Now, exponents of this new vision, <coughs> which came to be called Islam, extended their power and influence into vast areas of the world, stretching from the Pyrenees in Europe all the way to the Oxus River in Central Asia in a period of less than 100 years. Imagine that. This is pre-medieval period. This new explosion of energy engulfed both ancient civilizations such as Byzantium and Persia, and new peoples with their own historical traditions such as Zoroastrianism, Judaism, Buddhism, and Hinduism. And this process give, gave rise to new ways of living together in every field of human endeavor. Now, I don't mean to romanticize the origins of Islam, which were fundamental, fundamentally those of conquest. But there were also wider connections with the populations ruled by Muslims, which included trade and, most importantly, culture. The Indian Ocean route is a good example of how this empire grew even beyond the Oxus in the east, spreading to what we now call Malaysia and Indonesia, where my ancestors come from, and South China Sea. From these interactions, we discern the ideals of the prophet, both in his own life and in the revelation, being played out. Here I want to make the point um, that Muhammad as an ideal encomp encompasses more than Muhammad the man, in that one turns to the Qur'an, which was revealed through him, and the Sunnah, or his life and sayings, which were attributed to him by later scholars. Now this ideal also projects the juridical, mystical, and civilizational aspects of the Islamic world, which the scholar Marshall Hodgson calls the Islamicate culture, a notion which is attached to the wider aspect of cultural living where Muslims were or are dominant, rather than a purely faith Muslim culture. Now, this Muslim vision of a multifarious world was recognized as important by both Muslims and non-Muslims in the history of civilization, and which is vital for us today when certain groups within the Muslim world claim legitimacy through dogmatic assertion. Here I want to refer to some important facets and expand on how they address issues that are relevant to our modern world. These aspects are influenced by, infused with, the prophet as the ideal. They are the environment, which is a crucial issue, conflicts which are found all over the world and are jeopardizing society, the idea of living together in an increasingly globalized world, which today we call pluralism, the search for knowledge, which characterizes the accelerated pace of our scientific adventure, both in terms of technology and pure science. By the way, we should always be aware that this form of knowledge is neutral with regard to ethics. The principle of social governance, and accountability, which is now bedev bedeviling our world with such intensity. And finally, I will touch upon the need for each of us to embark on what I call the inner journey, which is the only way, it seems to me, to find true meaning and purpose in our lives. So let's take in the environment. As I've already said, we're so lucky to be in this beautiful setting which has been created on notions of beauty and balance to be found in the faith. It's clear that Islam and the Prophet himself regard the environment as sacral, or sacral, which has been given to all living creatures by the divine as a gift to be nurtured and not as an entitlement to be squandered. The earth, metaphorically, is our mother, and we are entrusted with her well-being. This sacral quality of the environment is beautifully expressed in many verses of the Quran, and one pithy verse reads, O children of Adam, eat and drink, but waste not by excess, for Allah loves not profligacy. The trust I've mentioned, <clears throat> which in Arabic is known as amanat, extends to everyone, to all creatures, indeed to all creation, even to inanimate objects. We are asked to treat them with respect, 
There's a wonderful parable called The Animal's Lawsuit Against Mankind, written during the 10th century by Iqbal Safar, where the animals complain about their treatment by human beings. And I had the pleasure of reducing the story to a 15-minute exposition for an audience with attention deficit disorder, which I know you haven't got here. <laughs> but it was fun to do it, I have to tell you. It was fun because I had to keep the attention of the audience focused by telling the story in short form and with energy. What the story showed us what the story showed was that human beings prevailed, but with a caveat, that they were stewards or vicegerents for the animals and indeed for all creation. Not only is the natural environment regarded as sacred, but we find that this respect is extended to the built environment, where Islamic societies not only look for delicacy of form, but also the appropriate use of materials, including the use of energy and water, and plants, as we can see right here in this building, which is framed by beauty and balance. I want to take another aspect of how Muhammad, as a model for our time, can guide us, this time in the field of conflict resolution. In the Quran, the notion of sulh, or negotiated settlement, is mentioned prominently. This entails, again, trust, or amanat, as I've mentioned, between people and this quality is required, this trust is required from the person who acts as an arbiter in conflicts where he is regarded as a figure of trust for those coming to him for solutions, which he does not proffer, but enables the party to reach for themselves. It's almost a form of uh, therapy, therapeutic engagement. The example of Muhammad the man, even before he became prophet, the prophet, shows a win-win solution that he provided to con the conflicting parties in Mecca when the black stone, which is in the center of, of the Kaaba, was being placed back into the restored Kaaba. These uh, people fighting with each other were important families belonging to different clans who vied with each other for the honor of placing the stone back into its niche. Muhammad, who was known by the people as Al-Amin, the trustworthy, and thus, at the time, had the respect of all parties, could have suggested that he placed the stone on the basis that everyone had agreed that the first person to arrive in the precinct the following morning should do the honors, since he happened to be the first to arrive. But he refused this privilege. He refused it. Instead, he persuaded the four parties, each, to hold a corner of a cloak upon which he placed the stone, and then for them to carry it to the Kaaba in the cloak and lower it into the niche together. Now, if this is not a win-win situation, uh, then tell me one that is. There's this wonderful approach resonates with the best principle of modern-day mediation, which encourages the value of impartiality and non-partisanship. It also encourages compromise a non-adversarial contestation in order to create solutions acceptable to all. Not easy, not perfect, but the right way to move. And Muhammad's creative and ingenious solution to that problem fits in the, the principle of generating practical options to find solutions. <clears throat> Another example of his life <clears throat> which relates to mediation is to be found um, in the story where he forgives a woman who habitually emptied a trash can over his head as he passed by each day under her balcony. He obviously didn't like him. Mecca. <clears throat> when, he failed to, when she failed to do so on one occasion, he inquired after her and was told that she was ill. So he sought permission to visit her and give her solace. Now this act is in the best tradition of transformative mediation where forgiveness plays a cardinal role. At the heart of this lie the principles of compassion and mercy, which preface each Muslim prayer, and indeed, which are found in all the great faiths and in our shared sense of humanity. This then takes me to the next principle, the respect for pluralism, which involves the way we should treat each other in our daily lives. By this I mean how we descend from the high-blown abstractions to the practical and messy world of mixed motives, 
<clears throat> and the perennial problems of engaging with others. Here, Muhammad is deemed to respect the Quranic assertion, which states that we are all created from one soul, it was mentioned earlier. The verse in Surah An-Nisa reads, O mankind, fear your Lord, who created you from one soul, and created from it its mate, and dispersed from both of them many men and women. Now this verse points the way to a cosmopolitan ethic, which calls for an engagement even if we don't agree with another's perspective and belief. And this is based, if you like, on the, uh, on the principle of the golden mean, to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It calls for a celebration of diversity as a blessing of God, and it's one of and it's one which we should embrace and practice in the cause of a shared vision for a better commonweal for all peoples on the planet, <clears throat> and also, as I've suggested already, for all creation. Now, this principle was exemplified by Caliph Omar, one of the four rightly guided caliphs, when he entered the gates of Jerusalem as a conqueror. Entered the gates of Jerusalem as a conqueror. Conqueror, very opposite for today. When he was asked to pray by the patriarch Sophronius in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, he politely refrained to do so. But he felt that by doing so, it would encourage the conquering Muslim army to take over the church as a mosque. That was a clever move. Park it. Another example of this respect for, other, for the other is encompassed in the Charter of Medina, which I've already mentioned. It addresses the issue of differing tribes and faith communities living together in Medina and respecting each other. It is very interesting and important that the spirit of this charter has been resur resurrected recently in Morocco. And I have a friend here from Morocco, two friends. Um, where it has been invoked to encourage Moroccans to live harmoniously with others. A declaration was made in Marrakesh in 2016 which addresses, addressed the importance, and I quote, of defending the rights of religious minorities in predominantly Muslim countries, and that of, I quote again, representatives of persecuted religious minorities. This declaration gains its inspiration from the Charter of Medina. We should note that the King of Morocco, King Muhammad VI, stated at this event, and I quote, we in the Kingdom of Morocco will not tolerate the violation of the rights of religious minorities in the name of Islam. I am enabling Jews and Christians to practice their faith, not just as minorities, he adds, they even serve in the government. This ideal sets a new benchmark for Muslims based on an authentic religious pr uh, principle. Now, I hope I've given you some pointers on how we can read the Prophet's life and example as man and model to help us engage with various existential problems that beset all of us. So we can act as a guide for our thinking and actions with regard to how we treat our environment, for how we should act towards each other <clears throat> and resolve our conflicts in an amicable and equitable way, and how we may live in comparative harmony together whilst professing different faiths and values. Now I want to turn to the role of the intellect in the understanding of our lives. We should not forget the first verse revealed by the prophet, uh, by the angel who commanded him, please note the word command. This is not an invitation, but an obligation for the prophet, and thus for all of us, to read and to seek knowledge. And the prophet encouraged us to seek knowledge in all places, even unto China, which is the last port of, of call at the time and not the first as it is today in our globalized and consumer-driven world. Muhammad the man <clears throat> practiced this ideal of searching for knowledge when he asked Muad ibn Jabal, who was being sent to Yemen uh, as a designated head of a group of missionaries at the request of the king of the region, the following question. According to, to what will you judge? According to the book of Quran of God, Muad replied. And if you find nothing therein, according to the sunnah of the prophet, responded Muad. And if you find nothing therein, then I will exert myself to form my own judgment, said Muad. 
The prophet is reputed to have given Moab double du'as or blessings. We can see here that the prophet encouraged Moab to think for himself when there was no explicit guidance, either from the Quran or the Sunnah. In today's knowledge society, this point of view is very relevant, but this hadith or tradition has to be underpinned by another Islamic principle, which is that knowledge is encouraged, but it also has to be supported by the ethical commitment of it being used for the benefit of people, rather than for gaining power and exploiting others. This is a concern which has become extremely urgent for our modern world, in where we have exponential growth driven by super-powered computers, which present us with the possibility of even conquering death. Also, we should note that so much of our social media is now dominated by a handful of companies who are in fact changing our ways of thinking and feeling. This is a clearly a deeply problematical issue since these companies do not appear to have any compulsion as yet to act in an accountable and ethical manner. But in Islam, there cannot be irresponsible knowledge. However, we should note that this perspective or understanding of knowledge is not a simple recipe of so-called good knowledge. The situation is more complex in that ethics is not a closed system but needs to be constantly negotiated, taking into account the time and place where it has been considered. Now, this statement itself is also affected by the problem of what is right and wrong in practice. The principles are clear as abstract values, but become more challenging in real life. The devil is in the details. Now I want to touch <clears throat> on another issue, which is relevant for all of us, especially in this churning an almost burning world of ours. Each time I look at the news, you know, I flinch. I get depressed. Turn the thing off. Turn the damn thing off. And this makes me think about the nature of good governance. How are societies to function? What is the future of the rule of law as we in the West have been taught to understand it? And this is a bedeviled question now in extreme peril with the rise of populism and its associated savagery like xenophobia, discrediting of critical thinking and expert knowledge, the trivialization of social institutions that give some orderly existence to us, and most depressing of all, this business of so-called post-truth, where lies are taking over from speaking honestly, sticking to facts and cogent analysis, which distinguishes between a statement and an assertion or opinion, which is fashioned to affect the emotions rather than educate. Here again, the notion of amana, trust, is very important. It permeates the classical letter reputed to be sent by the father-in-law of the Prophet, Caliph Omar, to Abu Musa al-Mashari, where he outlines the principle, principles that a Muslim judge should follow and the sense of trust that he needs to live up to so that those who are seeking justice from him don't fear that they will be unequally treated through intimidation. A similar theme runs in the famous letter of Khalif Imam Umar Ali to Malik uh, Ashtar when appointing him as the governor of Egypt, where he exhorts Al Ashtar to pay special attention to those most in need, um, to those, sorry, to those most in need um, of justice. In this case, the destitute, the disabled, orphans, and elderly. They should be treated in such a manner that enables God to excuse him, that is Allah star, on the day he comes uh, face to face with divine. Ali emphasizes that this obligation is onerous for governors, but God makes it easy for those who aspire to the hereafter, who restrain their souls in patience and trust in the truth that is promised to them. Now, you know, he recognized that the virtues he was asking Allah star as a judge are not easily obtained or enacted. But what becomes clear to me when I contemplate Ali's advice is that these difficult principles become more practicable if one keeps in mind their transcendental backing. So let us find ways, uh, you know, that we're not uh, uh, try to ease ourselves out of finding convenient letouts and so-called pragmatic solutions. We're always failing, but as long as we are aware that we are failing, as long as we are still hearken to our conscience and the need for akhlaq, as the Muslims call it, which is the action, obligation to act ethically, there is hope that we shall pay, um, 
advice, uh, attention to Ali's advice. Now, um, I will go to the last thing because time is running out very, very, very quickly. Um, I've spoken for some time about how the prophet can and does influence the man and model. And we're talking about pluralism and governance and so on. Now I want to make a final point which underlines all these principles and which for me at least underscores the faith of Islam and, represents by, uh, and is represented by the figure of Muhammad. This is, for want of a better term, I call the inner life, the self-realization of inwardness, which, it pro which paradoxically transcends the ego, by which I mean we lose ourselves and we look inside ourselves. The Prophet advised us to die before we die, whereby we recover our own fallible spiritual reality through prayer, meditation, mindful contemplation of holy texts. There's a Christian tradition called Lectio Divina, which the Benedictine uh, monks use for reading texts slowly and absorbing these texts. Um, and also, uh, for Muslims, the life and sayings of the Prophet. When we look inside ourselves, we enter the realm of dream, aspiration, longing, desire for the greater, and possibly ecstatic retrieval or remembrance that mystics and poets such as Rumi and Attar, even Arabi, Rabia, al Dawiyah, Nasir Khusro, and many others speak of. All these people lived in different parts of the Muslim world and in vastly different eras. Now we enter the realm of visionary utterance and silence, of light and stillness, of suffering and unexpected joy, which reflects divine grace or what must Muslims call baraka. The, the, uh, the prophet ex exemplifies all these qualities. So first let me consider light, which is called nur in Arabic. It is the prophet's father, Abdullah, who had this light and he passed it on to Amina, his wife, when she was pregnant, and then the Prophet received this light of blessing. This is an uncanny quality. We are moving beyond the everyday to the transcendental, which we may only glimpse. As for inner search, the Prophet again is a supreme exemplar. As he grew older, he started to practice the process of retreat, as I mentioned, and as prophets did before him. He would retreat for days. He was searching for something. Perhaps it was not clear to him what he was searching for, or waiting for. Search is also waiting. And then suddenly, unaccountably, he was assailed by this towering presence I mentioned, another powerful ethereal light, another being which took him by the scruff of the neck and commanded him to recite. Muhammad, as I said, was perplexed, terrified by the unearthly experience. He escaped from the clutches of this being, whom he later recognized as the angel of Gab angel Gabriel. We must not forget, by the way, we must not forget, angelic presences were real to people then and he fled from Mount Hera in terror. Not only was the presence overwhelming, but Muhammad was in fear of losing his mind. Was he mad? Was he invaded by the jinn? He did not know. This was the beginning of Muhammad's inner vision research for the divine. It was shocking and electrifying, not to be taken lightly. This powerful experience of Muhammad is symbolic for Muslims who seek an inner truth. It also reminds us and we are sorely in need of reminding uh, today in a world which is obsessed by the outward appearance of faith. It reminds us of the luminous reality that enriches the heart of Islamic revelation and indeed all authentic faiths. Fortunately, hundreds of millions of Muslims continue to respect and follow this example of the Prophet's experience, his own inner journey. I only touch on this profound influence of the Prophet because we're running out of time. In fact, I think we have run out of time. Um, so I, I, I will just end by saying that we must all search for this inner life on our own in silence and stillness. I would like to end, if I may, although it's been re I'm repeating it in a way, but I think it's important of the Al Khan statement that he made at the Syriac conference. Um, he was asked the question whether we have a clear, firm, and precise understanding of what Muslim society is going to be in the future. And his answer, the answer is uncertain. Uh, where could we find inspiration, he was asked. He mentioned the Holy Quran, for example, and I quote, of Allah's last and final prophet. He pointed out that the life of the prophet provides us with the fundamental guidelines we require. So let me quote his words directly again. You've heard it, but I'll say it again, for it's really worth it, the part of it. 
The prophet's example of integrity, loyalty, honesty, generosity, both of means and of time, his solicitude for the poor, the weak, and the sick, his steadfastness in friendship, his humility, humility in success, his magnanimity in victory, his simplicity, his wisdom in conceiving new solutions for problems which could not be solved by traditional methods without affecting the fundamentals of Islam, surely all these are foundations which correctly and sincerely interpreted must enable us to conceive what, we should, be, what should truly be a modern and dynamic society in the years ahead. So said the Aga Khan. Thank you very much for listening so attentively. Thank you, Rafiq, for an intellectually stimulating presentation which touches upon some important global issues. I will now call upon Dr. Nadia Ibu Jamal to come onto the stage for the moderator discussion. <coughs> Nadia has a PhD in Near Eastern Languages and Literature from New York University and is a specialist in Persian history and culture in the period of the Mongol rule, with an emphasis on the Ismaili communities of the time. She is actively involved with the Institute of Ismaili Studies on some of its programmatic activities, as well as on various projects with the Aga Khan Development Network. She's author of The Surviving the Mongols, Nizari Kuhistani, and the Continuity of Ismaili Tradition in Iran. Nadia has been traveling, and we are deeply grateful to you, Nadia, for being with us here tonight to moderate the session. Nadia, over to you. Thank you. <laughs> Leaders of the Ismaili <coughs> Council for the United Kingdom, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege and honor for me to have been invited to moderate this evening's question and answer session. Um, I would like to thank you for that opportunity. Each year, <coughs> millions of Muslims come together to commemorate the life of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his progeny. Believed by Muslims, to have been sent by God as a mercy to mankind, an exemplar and a light. Tonight we've had the opportunity, a wonderful opportunity, to be reminded of all these facets mm -hmm. in a truly <clears throat> illuminating and inspirational talk by this evening's speaker. And for me at least, it brings to life the message of the prophet in a way that hits both the head and the heart. Uh, we often talk about the intellect, but it's also the inspiration of the prophet that touches the heart. So I'd like to thank you for that. Thank you, thank you. I'd like to start today's question and answer session by posing a few questions myself, if mm -hmm. I may. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, we're living in challenging times. Um, Muslims are being disparaged in the media. Um, sadly, Muslims are disparaging each other. Um, in your talk, you laid out several principles which resonate with the global issues we face today. So my first question to you, which I'm sure is a question that many in the audience would also be asking, would be that given the Prophet's belief in the power of dialogue, negotiation, compromise, conflict resolution. Perhaps you might share some thoughts with us as to how this value could be embraced in conflicts both amongst Muslim communities as well as between those of different faiths. Gosh, it's such a difficult It's question. a very difficult question. 1.76 billion people. <laughs> it's not a monolithic, uh, monolithic um, culture, religion. Um, I think... I think it's by talks like this, people talking more about it, because all we get, especially in the media, is, oh my goodness me, Daesh have done something, oh Didn't gosh, survive. the Iranians are behaving in a bad way, and you know, Lebanon's gonna crack up. Um, so the media plays a role in this, yeah. uh, not just in the West, the media all over the world. Um, and our media, I don't mean just TV, I mean social media yes, too. Social media. Um, and I think uh, too much is time is given to people 
and, as, and I've said earlier on in my talk, we all have a different perspective, and that's fine. But I'm not going to be beaten down by the perspectives of these appalling people with dogmatic assertions about what they think is right for the Islamic world. And indeed, the non-Muslims saying, oh, Muslims are all a bunch of thugs and blah, blah, blah. We've got to find a way, and there are millions and hundreds of millions of Muslims who think not dissimilar from the way you and I think. And indeed, I, I think we spoke about it earlier. Some of the stuff that, that, that the young Muslims are doing, I don't particularly go for. It's sort of quite commercial and it's quite consumer-oriented. But so what? Let it be. Let them, what we've got to find is how do we get into the modern world. Yes. Yeah? And not think in sort of 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th century. By the way, there was wonderful things happening in the 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th yes. century. But we've forgotten that for the time being. It'll come back. I yes. believe. I'm actually quite optimistic. Do you think that people actually recognize the, the sort of the message of the of Prophet Muhammad um, in their lives, or do you think that they see it as something separate from their lives? I think a lot of people probably see it as something separate. Stu you know, it's like oh, stuck in that age, yeah, yeah, stuck Ada, in and also you know, like the Indian will say, Muhammad, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, is someone up there, but we ignore him. We put him on the pedals, and then we just yes. ignore him and get on doing our deals and wheels and being appalling to each other. So, and and not actually looking at the the, the, the stories to come out of the, of the prophet's life and indeed mo model, you know, image. So, um, I have another question yeah. for you. So many people feel that one of the major issues today relates to a societal norm where the focus has increasingly centered on the material and the secular. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's reflected in many, as you mentioned earlier, um, many disparities, mm -hmm. social, economic, um, political, religious, um, even unbridled greed mm -hmm. um, that might have been. And we see this reflected in, in financial systems, in the lives of various individuals. Um, you did touch on this briefly, but what do you think from the worldview that Prophet Muhammad engendered could really be taken to inform some of today's thinking? <clears throat> I, 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 I'm all for the secular. I live, I live in the West. I choose to live in the West and not go and live in some um, theocratic society. I think what we are in danger of losing, though, are some of the ethical values. Now, as I said in my talk, ethics is not so clear-cut. Morality may be clear-cut. If you do so-and-so, you'll be all right. If you do so-and-so, you'll be... No, the rules and morality. Ethics is actually questioning what is right and wrong. I, I think we do that in the secular side, but I think something terrible has happened in the last decade or even the last few years with the so-called post-truth society, where, as I argue, people are disrespecting integrity, personal integrity. So how do we go back to finding the, the personal integrity uh, Nadia, I don't have the answer for that. No. And I don't think that religions per se, organized religions, have the answer either. I think part of it comes, as I said in the last bit of my talk, is looking in to yourself, looking inward, and, and contemplating, and meditating, and asking yourself... Well, you know, the, the, this whole thing of uh, greed, we're talking about greed. Um, the, the, the Swedes have a, 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 an idea... Uh, about what is called lagom. It's enough. Yes. It's basically shaping your life such that you're just not putting yourself at the center, but also oh, thinking yes. about others yeah, yeah, in yeah. everything that yeah. you do. Yeah. Uh, sharing of knowledge, as you said, seeking knowledge, sharing knowledge, um, yeah. sharing of your wealth, sure. sharing of yeah. your time. Sure. And, um, and the and idea of not aspects. putting yourself in the center. If people start to practice that, they'll find, my God, that's a relief. I'm <laughs> not in the center. The luggage has been thrown out. My wife is always saying to me, get rid of all the stuff you've got in the house. Get rid of all the stuff. I've already got rid of 400 books to the Smiley <laughs> Institute of Studies, <laughs> but now I've got to get rid of 2,000 books. So she's, she's Swedish, Lagom. So yes. get rid of it. And actually, it's a relief. You travel light. The Buddhists yes. talk about it too. Yes, I no. think it's a common feature yeah, in most humanity. in, uh, yeah, yeah, in yeah. humanity yeah. as well as in yeah. religious yeah. traditions. Yeah. yeah. So I come to oh another question. <laughs> this is going to be a tricky yeah. one. <laughs> I've seen a very nice one at the for moment. You. <laughs> um, 
As a poet, um, a renowned poet, I, I should that, say, yeah. uh, and a translator mm -hmm. who understands the power of the word, the power of language, um, the power of the symbol, um, and also the challenges that surround the word, mm -hmm. translation. Mm -hmm. um, Many people are really concerned about this idea and this notion of engaging in translation or even more so interpretation. How does one go about this notion of interpretation? Um, you know, interpretation of sacred texts. It's a complex issue, but could you share some thoughts yeah. on this? I mean, you know, as soon as we're born, we're interpreting, yeah? We're yes. interpreting our mother or whatever, light, the hand movements. So, and by the way, texts are not just written stuff. Yes. Uh, clothes that you wear are texts. Everything that you see are, are texts to be interpreted. We, we are, as soon as we, we're alive and in, in, we're interpreting, even an, an autistic person will be interpreting something in, in, in a way uh, that a non-autistic person will. So we, we are condemned to interpret. I think what we have to learn is also to interpret, first to interpret ourselves. And that's a lifelong journey, yeah. right? You're not saying, I've got the answer, it doesn't work like that. But I suppose part of the thing is, that it's, it's, it's the journey that counts. I think it was Jean Genet who said, uh, it's not the destination, it's the actual journey that counts. Attar says that too yes. in the Conference of the Birds. Yeah. It's the journey that it's counts. The, the people, the, the group arrive at the end, only 30 birds, Simurg. The rest of us perish mm -hmm. on the way. But we must go on that journey and, and have a, a, a degree, of, you mentioned earlier about uh, a degree of modesty and say, we've got to try again, try again, try again. I went to see uh, yesterday um, an exhibition in the Royal Academy, and I recommend it's coming off on Sunday, of Jasper John's painting. And I'm afraid my friend Farad has missed that because I'm not around here, so he can't come with me this time. But it's interesting how Jasper John has done his paintings because I went two or three times before and I went yesterday and spent time there and I saw things in the painting because I actually listened to the, what the, the, the artist was talking about. Gosh, I didn't see that. So it's the way of being intelligent in looking at it. But don't be too imp impatient or ambitious about yourself. We all work at a certain level, but it's when the penny drops. I mean, Farad actually and I went to um, uh, uh, an exhibition some time ago. Farad claims, oh, he doesn't really know. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but he can see detail that I didn't see. And that's exciting. Suddenly we were becoming, you know, we were bonding in a different way. It was lovely. So, As many say, it's an unveiling of truths. Yeah, yeah. And texts are many layered and tricky. And by the way, we're all texts ourselves. People are reading us, and we have to read ourselves. And that's why, even when I speak about the Prophet Muhammad, I'm only, you know, like, what, 1,400 years later, I'm reading written texts about him. Yeah? Yes. And what about translation? Translation. You know, translation has played such an important part in early Islamic uh, culture, because it's through the Islamic eight world, it's not just Muslims, there were Jews and Christians there, who were translating the classics, Plato, Aristotle, pre-Socratics, into Arabic and other um, languages, into, into the Western world that came, we were the conduit, if you like, the Islamic world. Um, and translation was necessary. There is a problem um, that translation could also be a form of, um, what's the word I want, um, uh, um, of colonialism, if you're not careful, of being imperial. Mm -hmm. And there is that danger a little bit, I'm afraid, in the Muslim world of saying, um, you know, you've got to know Arabic, really. Uh, and again, the, the Dr. Keshavi and Muhammad Keshavi are doing, and I do in this is, um, Sharia book, we don't speak Arabic. Now, I know that there'll be people saying, well, you don't speak Arabic. How can you write about Sharia? Well, excuse me, wait a minute. Are you saying Islam is an Arabic religion? Because if you are, then it's not a universal religion. So translation is always necessary and always imperfect. So you just have to work through the imperfections all the time. Which should be fun, actually. 
I think it's the dynamic of purity. Somehow oh. there, is a, there is a sort of a notion that there is something that is pure and that takes away from encounters, that takes away from interconnectedness, that takes away from sharing, it takes away from all kinds of things that um, really are, are not in keeping with the world view uh, at all. Nadia, there's, there's a parallel and perhaps even uh, they were influenced by a lot of uh, 20th century Islamists with German romanticism where there was a notion of purity there, which led to fascism or, yes. or Nazism. You know, purity is a dangerous word. <laughs> Keep it at a distance. And by the way, none of us are pure. <laughs> we discovered that in England. <laughs> you know, come on, you know. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. It's and, a and, challenge. And, I, and I don't want to be pure. I mean, I come, from, <laughs> I come from Indonesia, Belgium, Hyderabad. Hey, I love it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It's so purity is not what I... Well, I would like to pull this to a close. We will be around. I'm, I'm speaking on your behalf that we will be around if anyone would like to um, spend a few moments yeah, yeah, sure, afterwards. Sure, sure. And uh, I thank you all for uh, this discussion. I thank you so much, you. Rafiq, for thank you. taking thank the you. time. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so Nadia. much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you will all agree that that was a thought-provoking and highly informative discussion. Uh, sincere thanks to you, Rafiq, and to you, Nadia. All that leaves me to say is thank you for coming, have a safe journey home, and kudafis. Thank you.